Hello my friends and welcome. Today's story is about a few of the many Irish women, who volunteered to work as nurses, during the First World War. Many joined British organizations such as the Queen Alexandra Imperial Military Nursing Service. The exact number of Irish women who took on nursing roles is not clear, but it has been suggested that at least 4,500 Irish women served as nurses, in the Voluntary Aid Detachment, known as VADS, of which at least 43 gave their lives on active service, between 1914 and 1918. Irish nurses not only served in Britain and Ireland looking after injured soldiers, but they also served on the front lines in France, and even as far away as the Dardanelles. In September 1916, the Irish news outlets reported the loss of yet another young Irish life on overseas war service. On this occasion though, it was not an Irish soldier, but a nurse who had died far from home. Mary Agnes Doherty from Magarafelt in County Derry, died from malaria and dysentery, in Thessaloniki, in Greece. She was buried in the local Lambeth Road Military Cemetery. The daughter of a retired Royal Irish Constabulary policeman, Mary was employed as a nurse in Dr. Stevens Hospital, in Dublin, in 1914 when she volunteered with the Queen Alexandra, Imperial Military, Nursing Service. She initially served in France, where she was awarded a Royal Red Cross and was mentioned in dispatches for her devotion to duty. In 1916 Mary was transferred to Thessaloniki where she died aged 28. Disease was a constant risk for those serving overseas. Many nurses also faced danger from shellfire while working in casualty clearing stations close to the front and from torpedoes while traveling overseas. Josephine Carr drowned, in the sinking of the Leinster mail boat, on October 10, 1918. Born in Cork in 1899, she had recently enlisted with the WRNS, to work as a shorthand typist. Josephine was traveling on the Leinster en route to England for work, and was with two colleagues from Cork, Maureen Waters, and Lillian Burry, who both survived the sinking. Maureen Waters recalled afterwards the moment of the torpedo collision. She said, the ship was standing upright almost, propeller in the air. I prayed as I never did before. Josephine's body, like so many of the casualties, was never recovered. She is however, commemorated on the WRNS Memorial in Plymouth. She was one of ten Irish women on active service who died in the Leinster sinking. Among the nine others was Claire McNally, a member of the Women's Legion, whose dad had been killed earlier in the war, while serving with the Connacht Rangers. The devastating impact of the war is further evident in the case of the Hackett family, in County Offaly, who lost two sons, and his daughter. Venice Hackett enrolled with the Red Cross in August 1916, aged 30, following the death of her brother Eric, at the front. After serving with a temporary detachment, she was sent to France in April 1917. But she became ill by the October, a few months after her brother, Leo, was killed at Ypres. She died in London while traveling home to Ireland, and is buried in the Ballycumber graveyard. Many of the women who died, are buried far from home, in England, France, Italy, Malta, Egypt, Palestine and Greece. Eighteen of the nursing casualties are commemorated in St. Anne's Cathedral, in Belfast, while others are remembered in parish memorials around the country. St. Mary's Church on Haddington Road in Dublin for example, includes Isa Mahani, a voluntary nurse who died from illness contracted while working on hospital ships in Malta, alongside her brother Edmund who was killed serving with the Royal Munster Fusiliers. While they were not killed in direct combat, these women are nonetheless part of the Irish casualties of the First World War, and their service and sacrifice is deserving of remembrance and commemoration. Although women's war service carried much less risk than that of the men in the armed forces, it was nevertheless an extremely dangerous job. Conditions were harsh aboard the ships and ashore at Belgium and France especially during the retreat at Mons which included the evacuation of the field hospitals as the German army advanced. 
Those left behind and who survived told of the atrocities by the troops of Germany which include extreme abuse, murder, and looting. Civilian patients were murdered in front of nurses and nuns, at the convent hospitals. British and French soldiers who were too injured or ill to move with the British evacuation were killed in front of the nurses who bravely remained to offer comfort and care. The majority of the young ladies who volunteered for service, were in their late teens to mid-twenties. Some of them, served near the front, while others, served their cause at home. Thousands of Irish women were mobilized on the home front to support the war effort. Over 2,000 Irish women worked in munitions factories in Ireland during the war. During this time, five national munitions factories were set up in Dublin, Cork, Waterford, and Galway. They manufactured everything from shells to tanks. The Great War resulted in the invasion of the political into the domestic sphere and disrupted everyday lives for civilians. The war was further brought home for Dublin civilians during the Easter Rising when they experienced bombardment and a crisis in food supply for the first time. Irish women and the war has received relatively little attention and was described as a historically hidden part of Ireland. Florence Lee was a dressmaker's apprentice, who had been earning a paltry two shillings a week, before the war started. In March 1917 she began making artillery shell casings, in the Liffey Dockyard Munitions Factory, where she earned about 50 shillings a week. It was dangerous work, and in September of 1917 a factory in Arklow blew up and killed 27 people. Mary Martin served as a VAD in Malta where she tended to many of the wounded soldiers in the Dardanelles. Before she left for a field hospital in France, Rosemary Savage lived in Cushendal, County Antrim, where she and her mother ran fundraising events in aid of the Comfort Fund for the 13th Royal Irish Rifles. Monica Roberts and her friend, used to go round the parish halls of Dublin County, performing singing recitals and gathering money to buy sweets, cigarettes, and gloves, to send as comfort parcels to the Dublin Fusiliers, stationed in France. She wrote to many of the men, some of whom were her own age. In their loneliness, some of the younger soldiers adopted Monica as their sweetheart. Her letters are in the archive of the Royal Dublin Fusiliers Association in Dublin City Archive and Library, at Pierce Street, Dublin. Sophia Violet Barrett was from County Galway. She joined the Carrick Mines and Kingstown branch of the VADs, and volunteered for service in Rouen and Abbeville in France. By the end of the war, from the Irish branches of the British Red Cross Society and the St. John's Ambulance Brigade, 83 women's VAD units, consisting of 2,927 members, had been established throughout the three provinces of Leinster, Munster, and Connacht, the majority being in Dublin. Moreover, the volunteer women workers in the Irish Leinster, Munster and Connacht War Hospital Supply Depot numbered approximately 6,000. By the end of May 1914 the Ulster Vads had 3,520 members throughout the province. Mary Martin returned from the war to set up the medical missionaries of Mary. Monica Roberts from Stillorgan married and reared her family on the banks of the Liffey. She died in 1974. Rosemary Savage married an Irish soldier in India and came home to live in Bandon. She died in 1983, having reached the great age of 90. Sophia Violet Barrett was killed while returning to the front from leave aboard the RMS Leinster, torpedoed on 10 October 1918, one month before the war ended. These were just a few of the many stories of the brave women who joined in the war effort. Some survived. Others paid the ultimate price. The question is, would you have walked the same path, as those brave women? And that my friends is another tale from way back in Ireland's history. Thank you for watching, and goodbye for now.